Welcome to Reliance Community Church. Our heart's desire is to help you connect with the living hope, Jesus Christ, by building a relationship with Him. The more we focus on discovering who God really is through Jesus Christ, the more we are changed. Knowing God intimately can transform your life into one of passion, joy, adventure, and peace. We hope this teaching can help you in your own personal journey. If there is anything we can do to assist you in that journey, pray for you, or encourage you, don't hesitate to contact us, and we'll tell you how to do that at the end of this teaching. We are so glad you are here with us today. And now, Pastor Joel. Life doesn't make sense. So go in your Bible to John chapter 15. I'm going to read from the Living Bible today. And it's a real interesting story that relates to a lot of people. And Christina, I loved your call to worship. I loved your take on John chapter 5. And uh, hearing that that guy might have been a wimp and all those things. And the perspective of. But I want to give you just an opportunity to take a look at a passage of scripture that might relate to you a little bit more. Because when you sometimes read scripture, you take the scripture and you relate it to a physical sickness. But I believe today on this journey that we live, there's a lot of people that are sick physically, people sick mentally, people sick emotionally. And I don't mean by by certain disease types. I'm saying that people are inflicted with shame. People are inflicted with guilt. People are inflicted with defeat where hope is not even a part of your journey. And that is just not how God designed you to live. God did not design you to live in failure. God designed you to live in victory. How many know that's true? So what I want to do is is go to John chapter 15, and I might just interrupt some parts of it. So John chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. And inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered Photo, por- uh, covered porches. What did you say? You said John 15. Oh, John 5. I, I, I'm just really tired. Of but I knew it was a 5. And I knew there was a 1 in it. That was the first verse. Okay, let me go again. You guys want to start with me again? I got excited. I'm just with John today, okay? It's the weed. Easy. I'm seeing multiple numbers, okay? If you got here early with us, how many knew that it smelled like something? How many know that? How many are hungry? Be set free. John chapter 5, verse 1. Let's go to verse 1 again. Okay? Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Stop there. I want to give you the picture. There's five of these porches. And these porches were set up around a pool. Now, the pool that we have a picture of is maybe the J.W. Marriott in Palm Springs with a beautiful, elaborate blue pool. It was not that pool. The water, the pool, was a stagnant water. And that stagnant water would turn red because of the iron in the ground. So the water wasn't even pleasing in sight. It wasn't crystal clear. It was ugly, stagnant, stale water. But see, what happened is there was a porch. And then you go to the next verse, verse 3. Check this out. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. Interesting. The people that ended up living in these places were dropped off. Say dropped off. That's a nice way to say abandoned. They were dropped off and put on the porch because they were no longer going to be cared for. So now you have a different impression of maybe what that man's attitude was. And what was the attitude of everybody that lived in the porch? See, what happens is if you notice, people of like weakness gravitate together and they try to find solace or hope in that situation. But when you're in defeat and everybody's in the same porch in defeat, what opportunity of hope do you even get? So it wasn't so much that, that maybe the guy that was like that for 38 years was just physically sick. I believe he was inflicted with doubt. I believe he had anger. I believe he had disappointment. 
I believe he felt like he was never going to get anything because everything depended on a right time, right moment, right place, right guy. And how many know in life you haven't been that right place, right time, right guy? You were never that, and you've always been waiting, and it doesn't happen. So when you hear a story of hope, you go, that's not me. You go, that's not me. That never happens to me. I remember once I was sitting in a, in a group of guys, we were all talking, and they said, did you ever win anything? Yeah, I said, I won a hockey, a hockey, at a hockey game, I won a car. I literally did. Detroit Red Wing game, I won a car. 1983, some of you weren't even born. It was a beautiful Buick Skyhawk. Loaded. Four speed. Air condition. Roll your own windows. I want a car. My uncle comes to, from Kennedy, says, I want to go on The Price is Right. I said, let's go. I ended up on The Price is Right, and I won. You might say, well, I've never had that. That doesn't matter. Because you get caught up thinking, I was the right guy in the right moment. That's not how Jesus plays. You're all the right people, the right place, the right time. You are the right one. Say, I'm the right one. See, but you got to believe you're the right one. I could tell you, say, jump through a circus hoop, or jump through a circus hoop, but you won't do it. You've got to choose to believe this because it's a concept of I have to ask you, which porch do you sit in? Do you sit in a porch where there's defeat? Do you sit in a porch where your mind is stuck? Mindset change doesn't happen because the porch in which you live is filled with doubt, filled with hopelessness. Because when you get into a certain crowd, certain words are okay to say in that crowd because you're a part of this. And see, if you're a part of anything at all and you're battling something, you get stuck in this place and you almost are suppressed and your faith is suppressed where you're afraid to even speak healing and hope because you've seen many others not have a miracle. So you're stuck in this, and you just sit back. James, how many surgeries have you had in the last year? Two. Are you any better off? Excellent. But you still had to have two surgeries. So he could sit in this porch and say, with another guy who had three surgeries and nothing's changed. And James could identify with everybody in this porch that's had surgeries. And one person in the room had a healthy surgery where things have changed. And pretty soon, the people around him will start almost ostracizing him and asking why he's different. See, the reality is a lot of people don't want you to succeed. A lot of people want to remind you of where you were, what you were, and how come you were stuck like that. But I'm here to tell you, you do not have to live at that address. Amen. That's not you. That's not you. So let's go to the next verse. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 days. Let's go to, we're going to read all the way through now. Thir years, yeah. <laughs> so when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? In another translation, it says, would you like to get well? whole. Verse 7, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water bubbles up, someone else always gets there ahead of me. Verse 8, Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Verse 9, instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Hmm. Verse 10. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up my mat and walk. Verse 12. Who said such a thing as that? They demanded. The man didn't know for Jesus had disappeared into the crowds. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Verse 15, then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. I'm going to work backwards 
towards the miracle. Isn't it sad that religion will always rob you of your miracle? A religious mindset will always rob you of your miracle. Because a religious spirit will always challenge the things according to to tradition or what you think is spiritually correct. The idea of the Sabbath, that he was actually healed, Sabbath was to be a day of rest. But Jesus saw a man with a need. Come back tomorrow at seven, the office is open. But Jesus saw the need, and he met the need. Why is it? I have to ask, why is it? Why is it that that we get so stuck with religious thoughts? Why is it that a religious spirit could suppress faith? Why is it a religious spirit can rob you of growth and cause judgment to come upon you? Why is it that we allow religion to do all of this? It wasn't religion that drove Jesus Christ to a cross. It was relationship because he saw the spiritual need. And so as I read this today, I'm thinking of each one of us that actually have residency on a porch. Which porch do we live on? And has religion kept us on the porch? Because religion will keep boundaries in your thinking that it doesn't always make sense. Because religion will tell you this, if you have a word of faith on a miracle that's about to happen that you're stepping into, religion will always ask you questions that will doubt anything. Think about it. When it was time to start a church, religion would always say, how's that gonna work? This will never work. Where are you gonna get this from? Now, when we saw the beginning of church, we didn't see this kind of room. We didn't see, but we saw people that God would call together to come together as a one people that we would worship because God spoke to us. Now, how does God speak to us? He puts something inside your spirit, and you are man, and you have spirit, and your spirit is prompted to do something. What is your spirit speaking to you to do, but you can't get off the porch? And you could be a Christ follower for a gazillion years, but you have heard something and you haven't gotten off the porch because your identity over 38 years has kept you stuck. I'm gonna be real honest this morning. Many of my years of ministry, I've prayed for the sick and believed for them to recover. I believed it. We've laid hands on the sick and we see people recover. We see miracles after miracles. But what about that one time you prayed and nothing happened? And what is religion do? It reminds you of that one prayer that nothing happened. And see, what happens is you've stopped asking for miracles to take place in your finance. You've stopped asking for miracles to take place because you doubt that anything can change. Because religion will always tell you what you shouldn't and can't. But relationship always tells you what you can and he will do. It's a big shift. It's a shift what I'm calling you to. You can live in the pain of a past thing or you can live in the excitement of a future thing. It all comes down to what the word of God says to you. If you practice the word, it will set you free because the thinking you've had for X amount of years is not healthy for many people. You've limited how God moves. You limit what God does. And we put him in a healthy box, like you said, Chris, in worship. And and you just put him like that, like he's the cute one. God is not the cute one. God is the God that created everything out of nothing. God is the one that is above all things. If you want to have a picture that he's cute, keep him as cute. But he ain't some cute little thing. He wants to kick the devil's work in you out the door. That's what he wants to do. That ain't a cute thing. That's a working thing. My God's a working man. My God is a God that doesn't sleep. My God is a God who loves unconditionally, that goes into that porch where we would walk in and say, that dude's been like that for 38 years. He ain't changing. I ain't wasting no more time on him. God walks in and says, where's the sickest? 
who've been this way for the longest. You have a note thing in front of you. I want you to write one thing that your mind has been stuck on for X amount of years that, have, that has kept you from living in freedom. And that's a religious thing that has to be cast off of you. How many understand what I'm talking about? Wow. I think the hardest question he asked Desi was this. Do you want to be made whole? Yeah. Larry, you want to be made whole? Yeah. Dougie, you want to be made whole? Absolutely. Roy, you want to be made whole? Mark, you want to be made whole? Ray? Dwayne, you want to be made whole? Lydia, you want to be made whole? It comes down to a question. It comes down to, you're asked this simple question, do you want to be made whole? Well, the, 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 the spiritual answer and the right answer is, oh yes, hallelujah. But then he says, okay, you're going to get whole, but here's what you got to do. You're going to have to pick your mat up. In the face of opposition, you will have to pick your mat up. You will have to pick it up, and others will tell you, what, 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 what are you doing? Because it's easier to keep you where you are. Don't, don't, Robert, don't, don't pick up your mat. It's better where you are. You already know what you're getting. A little bit of misery is better than not knowing. Pick up your mat. We are afraid of change. Shane, pick your mat up. Preach it, boy. <laughs> Ethan, I'm glad you're in church. He had a medical procedure. His dad's had one. It's just great to have him in church. Amen. So when I sit and look at all this, Shannon, pick up your mat, you're whole. No one controls the wholeness of who you are but God. Amen. Do I need to say that one again? No one controls your wholeness. No person no thing, nothing but God, if you give it to him. So there we are. We're on John chapter 5. And we got all the way to verse 5. But we've looked at verse 9 to 15, and we saw things there. Now the party's about to start. Now it's about to start. Would you like to be made whole? Well, here's how God sees you. Go in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, what's it say? That I am a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. So when I'm calling you out of the porch, I'm calling you by scripture. Are you a Christ follower? Are you born again and you've repented of your sins? You are a Christ follower. Does that mean you're perfect? No, no not at all but you are a Christ follower in process. Mm -hmm. So I just declare over you today, you are a new creation. The old is gone. Say, the old is gone. The old is, gone. is it? Is it? Some of it is. Some of it is. Let's look at another verse real quick. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5. This is cool. You are all, say all, children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. You have been set free. That's why I love the difference between Allah and Jehovah God. To Allah, you're just a slave. But to God, Jehovah, you are a child. What a difference. What a difference. That's scripture. So as we're talking about become whole, you've already had the working done. You've already had the working done. I was the biggest chicken. How many know that of walking into a dark house? Well, you know what? When I lost my partner in crime, I had no choice, but I had to walk in sometime. And it was one scary moment for me because that was the journey I had to walk into. And when I walked in there, Norma, 
the first time I walked in, I ran. The second time I walked in with a hockey stick. And the third time I walked in with knowing who God is within me that I don't have to worry. Amen. See, it's process. It's all process, right? You're in process. So if you're gonna understand what is living in you more darkness and light, chances are we might have to do a little bit more work in carrying the mat. So let's go to one more verse. Ephesians chapter two and 10. For we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So that's saying to us, you're not on the porch of defeat. I've already done the work. I created you. You are my handiwork. You are my handiwork. You might be sick in body, but you are still my handiwork. You are still my handiwork. You are still my handiwork. And the coolest part is, and he's preparing you to advance, to live out what God's doing inside you. John chapter 15, verse 16. He didn't want to carry his mat. John chapter 15, verse 16, it says this. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might what? Go and bear fruit. See, you know what's really cool about this, Sharon? Is he saw me in defeat, but I did the repentance and I became a new creation and then he started to invest in me that the darkness didn't overrule me anymore, that your behavior didn't have to affect my behavior, that all of a sudden I started to see the things that God could do, and then I come back to this, that he, he chose me. He chose me. And he not only chose me, but he said, you're gonna bear fruit. It just didn't choose you to sit there broke as a joke. He said, you come to me, pick up your mat, you will bear fruit, which means your life will prosper. Mm -hmm. This sounds like an infomercial that you watch at three in the morning because you can't sleep. And you're not sure if you should invest in it because it sounds too good to be true. Right? How many have been up that time watching that stuff? You think, does this work? <laughs> and you're hearing what I said and it's almost like an infomercial. Is, is that for reals? How many know what I just said works? Let me see your hand, if you really believe it. You know this works. What I'm saying works. Okay, if we know it works, why don't we work it? Because if we know it works, why don't we work it, and why do we get stuck there? So I'm going to give you an illustration that's going to hurt. And it's going to hurt because it's Scripture, and Scripture sometimes is sharp and cuts away things. And what I'm about to talk about is very interesting. So I want you to go to Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 4. Now this is interesting. As for, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, okay? As for you, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed with the water cleansing. You were not rubbed with salt or even wrapped in cloth. You're saying, what are you going to pull out of that? I'll tell you what I'm going to pull out of that. When a baby is born, it is work. I don't know anything about it. I got to deliver my youngest, so I saw something in a different light. I sat in the pilot's chair and pulled Brittany out. But I know this is when her mother was having her, she wasn't getting a manicure and a pedicure. <laughs> it was work. And it wasn't just work for mama, it was work for the baby. And there was working going on in the birth that was taking place. Some people come to Christ and want Christ to do all the work. Did you hear that? When you come to Christ, he don't do all the work. You have to do your work. You have to pick up your mat. Absolutely. You have to get out of things that aren't right to do right. Yeah. See what I'm saying? This is all scripture. This is a story about when you were born. 
And what happened when you were born? And when you were born spiritually, this is going to get deep. Because what basically happened is, for the baby, he lived in a matrix of a womb. That's all the baby knew. The baby had no idea what was going on, but the safety of the matrix of that room, of the womb, that was the lifeline. And the baby was fed directly from mama. And that's all the baby knew. But you know what's interesting? is when the baby's born, the baby comes out. And when, when Brittany came out, the doctor handed me the clamps and says, clamp the cord. And he says, now bite it off. No, he didn't. He said, cut it. <laughs> she was not born in Canada. And it wasn't a mission trip either. But he said, cut the cord. Why? Why? Because there's lessons from this scripture that I want to teach you. The reason you can't get new is you're still attached to the old. And if you're still attached to the old, you can't live on what was good inside the womb. The placenta had to be cut off because you couldn't live with that. Could you imagine if we were all walking around like aliens with the placenta still stuck to us, that that was our feeding tomb? Well, let me tell you what, spiritually, that's what it looks like when you want to have half in Jesus and half out. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. So you can't keep that old thing. You've got to get rid of. You've got to find a new feeding place. See, my identity, when I am born, I am born into something new. So I can't do what the old did. It's got to be new. How many get what I'm saying? So I, I asked the question, you want to get off the mat? You want to pick up your mat? You want to get going? Then you got to cut something off. Because I could invite you, I could invite you into this place outside the porch where there's freedom. But you know what's crazy, Hilario? I meet with a lot of people and we talk a lot of hope and we talk a lot of opportunities that could change. And they come all the way out here and it ain't but five minutes and guess where they went back? To the porch. Do you know why? Because you go back to what you know. Whether we like it or not, we live our life according to what we see, what we smell, what we taste, what we hear. And when you don't constantly have a diet of God, you will always be sucked back to the porch. And you will always have defeat. And you have the opportunity to change today of getting away from that place because I have to ask you the question, does the old really work? Uh-uh. How about number two? It says that you were not cleaned. This is a pretty powerful illustration. Because when the baby's born, the baby's born messy. And there's a residue. I want you to get this with me. There is a residue on some of you because you've come out of places of defeat that pull you back in and that residue is still there but you have to get cleansed of it. Of whatever broke you, whatever, whatever destroyed your hope. It could be a church experience. It could be, uh, could be a financial thing. It could be a business deal that went south. It could be a relational thing. It could be anything. But you've got to get that residue off you. So that's not what's making your choices. Are you getting that? It's almost like you've got to get that off of you. It's got to be washed off of you. It's got to come off of you because it's easier to be reminded of what it used to be and what it was, but that residue is all over you and it smells and it stinks and it always is there. And, and just when you start having hope, that stink gets stronger and you start getting stuck all over again. See, you have to be cleansed. Luke chapter eight, there was a woman with an issue of blood. She reached out because she wanted to be cleansed. I have to ask you, cleansing is not what you do. It's what he does. Amen. So the cleansing that takes place isn't me cleansing myself. It's me giving it to him that he cleanses me. 
And when he does the cleansing, it's a different kind of cleansing because he goes in pockets that I've hidden, that I know are there, that I don't want to deal with. But when he does the cleansing, he goes into those areas that I didn't want to deal with. He deals with them and he looks after them. How many know that's true? See, and that's what happens is some of us wonder why we're not free. Well, we never got cleansed. Some of us come to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Cool, that's the start. But now in, in, in transformation, there's things that are changing around you that you have to be constantly cleansed of that try to rise back up in you, that try to keep you a prisoner. See, I believe that God wants you to prosper in every area of your life. And the reason we don't is we get stuck with being unclean. Because God says he can't use something unclean. He can't do it. Then there's this other part. It says that the baby was not rubbed with salt. You know why the baby was rubbed with salt? Because the salt was used for healing. Because salt was used for where the baby was bruised, the salt would be rubbed on the baby and it would be applied and that salt would begin to bring healing. And let me say this one line. Somebody, some of us work so hard to get in the position of healing that we miss out on the experience of the healing. Because it's back to who's gonna move the water to get me in, so I gotta get in line to get the right thing. See, I just believe that where you are today isn't where you have to end up. I believe where you are today is only the beginning of where you could go. And then there's the last part. The worship team could come. The last part is, you were not wrapped in cloth. The interesting thing about being wrapped in the cloth and swaddled is in those days, the cloths were actually taken that were used from drying the cow when it gave milk. And what happens with those cloths is you were wrapped with these cloths. And you were swaddled. And the power of being swaddled, Shannon, is sort of cool in the sense that regardless of what's going on in our world today, we could be swaddled by his spirit that he will hold us and he will embrace us and he will cause us to experience that closeness that only God has for us. Thanks for listening to the teaching of Reliance Community Church of Upland, California. To discover more about us or to contact us, visit our website at www.reliance-cc.org or you may also email us at info at reliance-cc.org or call us at 909-294-6324. You may also write us at P.O. Box 966, Upland, California, 91785. We believe you are blessed and we hope we've helped you deepen your relationship with the living hope, Jesus Christ.